so please look out for that. Um, so today we have with us Dr. Eugene Samphone, who is the Medical Director, Director of On-Demand Medicine at Southwest Medical Associates. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you exactly um, what Dr. Samphone will be discussing today. Uh, he'll be discussing how they were able to build um, SMA Now Clinic, um, how they engaged their providers in it, um, and the launch of SMA, SMA Now Clinic, including marketing, uh, initial results, and then what's, what's going on in 2016 and beyond. So that's what he'll be covering, but before we get to Dr. Sonfone, we also have with us today Dr. Peter Antal, who's the Chief Medical Officer of American Well, and he's going to um, be kicking off today's webinar. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Antal. Great. Thanks, Beth. And hello, everybody. It looks like we've got a great, uh, great group, a uh, nice attendance today. So welcome to everybody, and thanks for taking uh, this time out of your day. A uh, couple quick comments uh, before we hand off to Dr. Somphone. Um, uh, first of all, you know, there's a couple of, of uh, uh, points here about American Well on the on the initial slide. American Well is sponsoring this program and has a, has had a long and deep uh, partnership uh, with Southwest Medical, uh, and uh, Southwest Medical has really been an early adopter organization with telehealth. So we're happy to have Dr. Somphone with us today. Um, a few things uh, quickly about American Well. We've been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, we've in invested an incredible amount of money in creating what we believe is the state-of-the-art telehealth platform out there in the, in the marketplace. Um, we work with over 170 different organizations, whether they're health plans, health systems, employers, or even retailers. Um, and we're the largest uh, video telehealth operator in the U.S. today. Uh, a couple quick points about where telehealth is at. Uh, I know uh, there's probably a range of familiarity on this uh, webinar today in terms of where we're at with telehealth. You know, one thing I start with is is that, uh, you know, our healthcare system has its share of challenges. Uh, you know, I'm often reminded of the, the quote that's attributed to Einstein about the definition of insanity, uh, which is doing uh, the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I think that's where we are today in, in, in healthcare. You know, I think patients are unhappy with uh, access and other things. Providers are unhappy. They, they often feel burned out and frustrated with how things are going. Uh, and, you know, telehealth is certainly not a, a, a cure-all, but telehealth is a, is a new way of thinking. Uh, it's a new way of interacting uh, that can really offer some promise uh, in, in terms of how it can help transform how care is delivered. Um, telehealth we define as, as uh, interactions occurring between care providers and patients or between care providers and other providers uh, using technology and specifically using devices that are uh, around everywhere, consumer-oriented devices, computers, tablets, smartphones. We really think we're past the days where you need $30,000 expensive equipment uh, and an IT person to manage it in order to, to have meaningful telehealth occur. Uh, 2016 has really been an inflection point for telehealth. Consumers have really uh, begun adopting and adopting in mass, uh, and that's exciting, particularly in acute care and behavioral health. Uh, there's widespread adoption uh, and, and growth. Um, this is also a year where providers are really beginning to adopt uh, in, in larger numbers. Um, providers see value in, in telehealth in terms of being more consumer focused or friendly, uh, achieving new uh, efficiencies, and the ability to build new programs through telehealth. Um, now that's not to say there aren't barriers. Uh, you know, picking uh, the right technology and learning how to use it, building workflows, assuring that you're reimbursed or credited for your work. I mean, these are all barriers or challenges, but none of them are insurmountable. Um, we see as the ideal state telehealth being really weaved into how healthcare is delivered. Um, uh, it's a tool for improving access, uh, for matching the problem the patient's experiencing with the proper point of care. You know, pink eye doesn't need, need a, an ER, it doesn't require an ER visit. Um, the ability to save time on patient side in particular, but also on the provider side, as well as saving money. And finally, the ability to build new programs, programs that are focused on interacting with the patient right in their home. Uh, particularly the chronically ill, uh, the mentally ill, or the patients with limited mobility. Uh, well, we, we, we also believe the perfect situation is in a fully capitated environment uh, where you have the ability to innovate uh, and you're not constrained by worries about reimbursement or will I get 
credited uh, or reimbursed at the proper rate. And I think the best example of that, you know, Robert Pearl, the CEO of Kaiser Permanente, uh, came out last year and said that Kaiser will be doing greater than 50% of their total patient encounters uh, through technology by 2018. Uh, so that's a dramatic statement. But I think it speaks to what you can do if you're in that, that fully capitated environment. So we're lucky today to have an expert in this topic, uh, uh, Dr. Gene Somphone. Uh, Gene is uh, an early adopter in telehealth and a visionary. Um, he's very experienced both in the practice of telehealth but also in the management of a telehealth program and building out the workflows, policies, and all the other things that are really key uh, to, to running a, a great program. Uh, Gene is a leader and a, and a longtime friend uh, of us at, at American Well, and so we're honored to have him uh, speak today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand off to Dr. Eugene Somphone. Hey, thanks, Peter, for the introduction, and thanks for everyone for joining in today. Uh, to probably just speak to you about telemedicine uh, and our experiences. Now, before we start about telemedicine, I just want to spend a moment talking about our organization, um, how it works, and how our business model influenced our foray into telemedicine. So Southwest Medical is the largest and oldest multi-specialty practice in the state of Nevada. Uh, it's been around for over 40 years. Uh, we currently have 22 offices and two outpatient surgical centers. Uh, we have roughly 350 providers, of which 60% are either family physicians or general internists. We offer primary specialty hospital and urgent care, uh, as well as specialized programs for the chronically ill, both in the office and at home. Um, we were originally part of a group called Sierra Health Services, uh, and that company actually owned a health insurance company as well as a medical group. Uh, we were acquired by United Health back in 2007, and they promptly split us up. And so the, so the insurance side fell under United Healthcare. And shortly thereafter, Optum was formed, and Southwest Medical became its first medical practice. So we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Optum and United Health Group. We are a multi-payer group, um, but in reality, about 90% of our revenue is derived from United Healthcare's HMO products in the state of Nevada. So United Healthcare insures about 350,000 um, commercial HMO lives, about 55,000 uh, Medicare Advantage lives as well as 200,000 Medicaid HMO lives. So they touch about 600,000 patients here in the state of Nevada. Uh, and we are shared risk with both the commercial HMO and Medicaid HMO and fully at risk for the seniors. Uh, we also see a small but growing number of patients who are insured through self-funded plans. Uh, in total, we have about 350,000 patients who count us as their primary care providers. But our department services about 600,000 patients. Uh, and we are primarily capitated. Okay, so we're not fee-for-service, primarily capitated. Uh, we are an integrated healthcare delivery system. Uh, we've been described as the Kaiser of Nevada. Um, so besides the practice, we have a home health company, pharmacy services, palliative and hospice care, outpatient surgery centers and feeding centers, uh, home visits for the chronically ill. Uh, we also have in-house medical management. So fully integrated. Now what I do is oversee our on-demand department. So basically responsible for all of our patients' acute care needs. Uh, we really want to steer our patients to the right level of care. So if you don't need to go to the ER, we want you to go to urgent care. If you don't need urgent care, hopefully telemedicine. Uh, our focus is on convenience uh, because we are compensated in part based on patient satisfaction and their perception of care. Uh, it's really important we provide high quality, uh, high satisfaction care. We try to resolve patients' complaints at the first point of contact whenever possible. Uh, we know that in the past, when patients would call into our call center, it would take about two days for PCPs to respond. So we're trying to improve that experience for, for patients. So our on-demand department includes our urgent cares, telemedicine call center. We currently have about 13 urgent cares and retail clinics. And these are full-service urgent cares. Uh, we have access to radiology, but not just radiology, but advanced imaging, CT, ultrasound. We have point-of-care lab testing. We have an observation unit in the fusion center. Uh, we also provide support to our call center. Uh, when calls cannot be resolved through protocol, they are routed to our telemedicine providers to resolve. And about three years ago, we added telemedicine to our portfolio of services. Uh, we're very busy, so this year we're on pace to see about 270,000 visits. So our company is fully supportive of Dr. Berwick's uh, triple aim, 
Okay, so basically it's improving the patient experience, improving patient outcomes via population health, and really reducing medical spend through uh, integration, through guidelines. But we've also went a step further like many groups. We call this the quadruple aim, which is adding provider and staff well-being. So how does a well-run integrated delivery system compare to our peers? Well, compared to fee-for-service, um, our medical spend per patient is about 12% less. Okay, and that's probably through integration, through guidelines. Uh, we're far better than most of our peers in quality defined as HEDIS. So we have a very powerful data mining tool in our EMR that will pull out gaps in care, coding. And so just five years ago, our senior, our Medicare Advantage plan was with a three-star program. Uh, last month, CMS awarded us a 4.5 star rating, and we just barely missed five stars. So quite a bit of improvement in the last five years. Uh, also, with our risk adjustment factor, so that's how CMS grades how complex the population is and how they compensate us. Uh, the years back, our RAP score was 0.7, and through our data mining tool, we've increased that to 1.5, which is probably in the top percent, top 10 percentile as far as RAP score. Because we're in a capital environment, we want to keep people out of the hospital and to utilize our resources wisely. So when we look at national rates at ER utilization for fee-for-service Medicare, it's all 550 visits per 1,000 per year. Here in Nevada, we're at 351, so far, far below the national standards. So how does telemedicine work into our capitated um, population health system? Well, it began back in 2013. The CEO here in Nevada, for United Healthcare, decided he wanted to offer telemedicine as embedded benefit for all of his commercial HMO members, which at the time numbered about 320,000 patients. It would be the first United Healthcare product in the country to offer telemedicine. Uh, I became involved in this around July or so of 2013, and quite honestly, at the time, I had no idea what telemedicine was. So we learned very, very quickly. And we had a very aggressive timeline because he wanted a full launch in January 2014, so it gave us six months. And before that, he wanted to start a pilot to just offer telemedicine to the United Healthcare employees in the state of Nevada to have them test out that system. So a very, very aggressive launch for us. And really, at the time, no one was practicing telemedicine in Nevada. In fact, I believe at the time, only about 20 some odd states. So we had to bring in a lot of experts in this legal experts, our lobbyists to petition the state to actually write laws to allow us to practice telemedicine. We had our finance folks and contracting issues with the health plan, with American Well, HR recruiting. We had never recruited telemedicine before. So quite a lot of cooperation among different uh, areas of our company. So who are our partners in forming our NOW Clinic? So the NOW Clinic is the brand. Um, as I said, the health plan would fund this operation. They would pay us a per member per month cost to run and staff the telemedicine practice. So they are our major partners. Uh, we were thinking about creating a de novo telemedicine program, but it turns out that working for a large organization like Optum, you have access to all of their resources. And it turned out that they had begun telemedicine a few years back. Um, it was branded Now Clinic, and at the time it was being offered in 20 states, and they had completed over 5,000 visits at the time. And from the beginning, they have partnered with American Well, which is the country's leading telehealth operator. So how to often choose American Well? You know, I've done probably well over 20 reference calls, and they always ask you, ask me, well, how did you guys choose American Well? Well, I can tell you that a large company like United Health, which is the nation's largest insurer, you know, they, they really want high quality care, consistent care. They want to work with partners who have a consistent track record in this area. And because it's so new, they wanted good expertise. So they wanted to meet with the leaders. We've met with the executive team from American Well. We all have a shared vision. And so in part, it's because of their expertise and their vision that we chose American Well as a partner. And it's been a very, very good relationship. Now in Nevada, how is that, that different? Well, several things were different. At the time, most television practices were fairly national, but really was relying on cash transactions. Here in Nevada, it was being offered as a benefit to our commercial HMO members. And we could really drive utilization by creating a benefit plan. Here in Nevada, it was a very, very low copay for a telemedicine visit compared to an urgent care visit, compared to an ER visit. We're also able to leverage 
um, our practice here among the brokers. Uh, we have meetings with them on a regular basis. And in all the employee health benefits, they can heavily market this to them as well. We also have the ability to, to steer patients. You know, sometimes straight, straight from the waiting room in the urgent cares, we can guide them from there to telemedicine. And most importantly, we had a large pool. As I mentioned at the time, it was 320,000 commercial HMO members who are now all eligible for telehealth. So how do we get started? Well, first of all, we had to get around some regulations. Um, and as I mentioned, at the time, there were really no rules written about telemedicine here in Nevada. So we were able to have them agree that, look, the providers need to be licensed in Nevada, but they don't have to reside necessarily in Nevada. Now, the origin of the visits have to be from within the borders. So this slide kind of depicts a provider in Georgia seeing a patient here in Nevada. We also make sure it was secure. Now, at the at the time, we really didn't know much about this, but to my knowledge, marijuana has never had a security breach, so that was very important for us. We had to decide what kind of prescriptions. You know, we, we took the low route. We didn't want to prescribe controlled medications and diet suppressants, those kind of things. So we made a conscious choice to not prescribe any controlled medications. And we also had to ensure the regulators that we had proper oversight and safety controls here. So how do we staff this? Well, at the time, uh, now Clinic American Well had a national uh, network of providers. Uh, we could have gone the national route, but we decided we wanted to hire our own dedicated crew. Now, why is that? Uh, number one, we wanted to be able to chart in our own EMR. Uh, number two, because we are in the world of capitation, population health, we want to do more than address episodic care needs. We want our providers to also address gaps in care and the code appropriately. So from the get-go, we decided we wanted to have local providers. And to staff for 24-7-365, we decide, well, you know, five full-time providers is probably all we really need. The other thing that was different was that most of the national telehealth companies employ primarily physicians, and we really believe in practicing top license. And we figured that, you know, we probably don't need a physician for each and every one of these encounters. So our model at the time initially was three extenders and two physicians with a team of per diem providers. We also wanted MAs to the steer traffic because we didn't know what kind of volumes we had. So we want MAs to be able to guide traffic. If someone was getting backed up here, they can steer the patient to another provider. So again, we have a crew of dedicated full-time providers per diem. But again, we didn't know what kind of volumes we would have. We didn't know whether we'd have one patient on day one versus 100. So we began training a lot of our urgent care providers to be able to do telemedicine during high volume surges. So about half of them are trained, and all the sites have access to a webcam and the now clinic program just in those high volume times. Now, as far as what kind of providers, you know, I can tell you that that recruit nationally for telehealth, it's not hard whatsoever. There are many, many folks who want to do it, and the perception that is that it's an easy job. It's low acuity, low stress. You work from home, um, and that's not always the right fit. You know, if you have a provider who wants to join because they want to slow down, that's really not the, the right fit. The other thing is that even though it's low acuity, I would argue that you would have to staff it with providers who have very high clinical acumen, who can make that diagnosis without the benefit of an examination. So an example would be a kidney infection. You know, we have to have providers who say, you know what, you probably do have a low-grade kidney infection, but you have no red flags, you're not septic, you're not toxic. So I'm okay diagnosing you with a mild kidney infection and treating with oral antibiotics. So again, you have providers who have a very good clinical acumen and good judgment. Uh, obviously, you have to be tech savvy. Uh, you have to be engaged and enthusiastic. You have to see the potential of telemedicine. So these are the folks that we're actually looking for. And the last thing is you have to be telegenic. You know, the fact is without the benefit of touching and feeling, you need to have someone who can come across in a presentable way on the screen. So we set some early goals. So um, the goal was we had to overall average less than 10 minutes um, per, per encounter for response time. We want high patient satisfaction because this is so new. We knew that if patients were not happy, it might take them years to return. So from the very first encounter, we wanted to make sure they had high patient satisfaction. The other thing is that there was a reputation that sometimes telemedicine is just a prescription mill. So we want to make sure that we just didn't prescribe unnecessarily. And just like urgent care, we're very good with antibiotics. So we chose um, the prescription-based antibiotics for respiratory infections. 
And the last thing is because, again, we are in population health and capitation, we want our providers to do more than just treat the episodic condition. We wanted them to review HEDIS measures that are uncovered, if there are any suspected ACC codes, we want them to capture those kind of things, so in addition to their acute episodic needs. Okay. So how do we recruit? Well, you know, we had a very short timeline, so the first thing I did was I contacted some of our, our really strong providers who used to work with Southwest Medical, who had left the company for, for personal reasons, usually it was a spouse relocating, and, and I'll tell you, more, more of these guys were you know, willing to come back to Southwest Medical. Um, so about three providers were actually former providers for Southwest Medical. Um, we also believe in benchmark testing. So they take these online personality tests. We did conduct some physical interviews, but we figured because these people will be conducting telemedicine visits, let's see how they come across a screen. So we did half of our interviews through Higher View, and it was just a, a virtual uh, interview on the screen. The other thing is, you know, we, we don't believe in a hierarchy. We believe that you're part of the team, you contribute equally, and so, so we really pay our providers exactly the same as a physical provider. We have some, you know, very, very quick training programs. You know, we had a, a three-month gap between the start of this program and our pilot program. And so we actually held a two-day in-physical training session of which half of folks attended physically, other half attended virtually. So we had WebEx training sessions, we had self-study modules, we did a lot of mock demonstrations, on and on. Uh, we actually brought in an expert. You know, Optum had a leading physician who had been practicing telemedicine for about three years, brought him in to help us as well. Now we wanted to make sure that, that this was a safe program. Again, at the time, no one was doing telemedicine in the state of Nevada, so we wanted to make sure that our providers felt comfortable. You know, we tell our providers, look, if there's any concern, have a very low threshold to move these patients onto the urgent cares, even the emergency rooms. We want to make sure they had access to support 24-7. For the first six months, we reviewed 100% of all charts. And even now, we still review 25% of charts, even though the state requires only 10% of chart reviews for extenders. And we also have a way to actually observe these visits. We can actually proxy in to the desktops to, to observe these visits between patients and providers, too. So initial launch here. So, you know, we had no idea what we were going to see. And so these numbers were sort of our best guess. And so we just figured that assuming 3% utilization with 320,000 lives, that we could hit even 9,600 visits that first year. Uh, that was sort of our goal. Uh, again, we want handle times to be pretty short because these are pretty easy visits. So between 10 and 15 minutes, speed to answer less than 10 minutes, and again, high patient satisfaction. So we first started this in October. So uh, this is a trial, a pilot, that we offered telehealth to all of the 3,000 United Health employees in the state of Nevada. We actually had a dedicated room on the corporate campus where, page, where employees could go. And we encouraged them to go as much as they wanted. We waived their co-pays. So whatever you wanted to be seen for, let's try this out. And the purpose was really to work out the technical glitches and to get feedback from the employees. Initially, it was just 12 hours a day. Um, in the last month, of the year, we then went to 24-7. So we launched on the 1st of January 2014, and the first six months we had very, very little fanfare. And that was done intentionally because we recognized with any new technology there'd be glitches. So the first six months was focused on working out the tech glitches, on making sure we had, can honor our, our service commitments, and so we had very, very little advertising the first few months. After for six months, we were pretty aggressive. You know, we have a pretty good marketing campaign. We had newsletter, email announcements. Uh, we have web portal, Facebook advertisement. We even have in-clinic navigators to a circular through the waiting rooms and offer now clinic to our providers who are waiting. We also had the ceiling danglers and floor decals. Uh, so pretty aggressive. The other thing that we could do, too, is, you know, our urgent cares, we post our wait times right when you walk in. On the left, this is sort of a typical wait time screen during the cold and flu season. You can see at some points it's a 90-minute wait. Then simultaneously, we'll have a screen that says you can be seen right now. Okay, So these are to encourage patients to go from the urgent care to now clinic. Again, a lot of brochures. The other thing is really you have to have word of mouth and you have to have support top down. And so you can see one of our front desk employees, she has a now clinic shirt on. 
And we have standard work for our front desk people. You know, at the close of the check-in, they'll say, have you considered now calling for your next visit? The hand of them in brochure. But it really need, needs to be supported from the top down. So what are operation results? Well, in year one, we ended up seeing just over 5,000 video consultations. So we didn't hit our goals, but not too bad. Uh, we enrolled over 18,000 patients onto Now Clinic. Um, our speed answer was actually pretty quick. Again, we had a goal of less than 10 minutes. So we actually ended up just north of four minutes. So from the time the patient clicks connect, it takes just over four minutes to connect with the provider. The handle time is pretty short, just over eight minutes. Uh, interesting, most patients are actually female, so young and female. Uh, and most of our visits were conducted through video. So when we first started, there was quite a few phone calls, but very quickly, it was all video. Customer satisfaction. So at the end of each visit, we have a post-visit survey. We wanted to, to assess our patient's satisfaction with their care. And you can see that um, it's mostly very, very favorable, four and five stars. Now, it's not truly really a top box method, but I can tell you the average score was 4.9, so very, very high. So year one, we were just north of 5,000. Year two, which is 2015, uh, we were just short of 8,400 visits. And then this year, we're on pace to see just over 11,000 visits. So it's definitely a very steep upward trend. Um, as far as the volumes, you know, Sunday's a little bit slower, but otherwise it's pretty evenly distributed Monday through Saturday. Uh, visit time of day. Um, most visits come actually during the, the daytime, very few after 11 p.m. Um, if it were up to me, it probably wouldn't do 24-7. However, it is a commitment we have to the health plan to staff nights as well. The connection type, the first six months, about two-thirds were done through laptop and computers, while well, within a very, very quick time, um, the mobile device actually you know, outgain the laptop and computer. So nowadays, about two-thirds, if not more, are through mobile devices. Uh, phone visits are probably less than 1% currently. The top diagnoses, so about one-half of all visits are either respiratory infections or bladder infections. And as mentioned, we want to make sure it was not a prescription mill. So just like the urgent cures, you know, the providers are incentivized and bonused to prescribe antibiotics judiciously. So at Southwest Medical, whether it's the urgent care or telemedicine, if you come with a respiratory complaint, whether it's cough, sore throat, congestion, uh, you get an antibiotic in less than one quarter of the time. And so telemedicine is pretty consistent with our urgent cares. Okay. The other thing is, is only 58% of times of visits are you prescribed anything at all. The other thing we're interested because, again, we are in a captive environment we want to make sure that, that patients end up in the right place. So we actually ask patients after the visit, you know, what would you have done had this not been available? So over 80% said we would have gone to a higher level of care, and the majority of that would have been urgent care, but you can see even 3% said ER. Okay. So definitely we have diversion there. So some of the challenges the first year or so. Um, so our volumes and enrollments really didn't hit where we wanted to be. And, and that's not too surprising. This was such a new thing. It was new to providers, new to patients. So the adoption was a little slower than we anticipated. Uh, it's really picked up the last two years, but that was one of the things the first year was we didn't quite hit our numbers there. Um, very few complaints. But the complaints we do get are usually centered around technology. So even though it seems pretty simple, for some patients it can be quite challenging. So we did have some connectivity issues. Um, and then uh, for enrollment, again, it doesn't seem that hard, but for some reason, some of, the, some of the patients have a hard time getting enrolled. So those are the primary challenges we faced the first year. You know, the concern when we started telemedicine was, is this safe? And that, that's a con concern echoed by other physicians and patients. Well, what I can tell you is that I sit on our health plan's quality review committee. So since we launched in 2014, we have had zero cases appear before the quality review committee. So that's very good. So we know that, that the outcomes are very similar for specified conditions. And we certainly have much, much higher patient satisfaction. So I would say for overall quality care and perception care, it's probably superior to your traditional visit for certain conditions. You know, our surgery director also published a recent study. And what he looked at was for restroom infections in our telemedicine and practice, you know, how many of these you know, require repeat visits? Uh, and you see from the urgent care, about a quarter actually came back within the next week just because they weren't getting better. 
However, with the telemedicine visit, it's only 4%. Now, I'm sure there is some selection bias here, but the point is that when patients go to now clinic for breast infections, they are highly unlikely to return for a second visit. Okay. So this year and next year, so what, what's going on here? Well, well, I can tell you, so at the end of 2015, we offered Medicaid. In the state of Nevada in 2014 with the Affordable Care Act, we added a quarter million new patients, either through Medicaid expansion or through the exchange. So the majority actually came through Medicaid. And United Healthcare is the biggest player in that space, and we're the biggest provider. So now all of a sudden you have this huge influx of patients, but not that many more providers. And Nevada ranks in the bottom fifth, I mean, I'm sorry, the bottom five states in terms of physicians per capita. So really it's an access issue. So we were able to lobby the state to allow us to get Medicaid. There was some concern on their end that perhaps would lead to overutilization, but that really hasn't borne out. So we were able to offer telemedicine to our Medicaid population beginning end of 2014. Um, uh, rheumatology, behavioral health, we launched our first quarter. Um, behavioral health is, is it's very, very poor access here in the state of Nevada. So we were able to obtain the service of two psychiatrists out of state to see our patients virtually. Uh, rheumatology, you know, we have a rheumatologist who has to travel twice a month to a to a city which is about an hour and a half outside of Las Vegas. So he's able to conduct most of his visits now through virtual medicine. And this year we're on pace to see over 11,000 visits. For next year, what's going on? Well, uh, for next year, we're going to be able to offer telemedicine to our seniors. So we'll design our benefit package to now include Medicare Advantage. So that's about 55,000 lives who will be eligible for telemedicine. Uh, last week, we just had our first summit with our specialists in American Well to, to broaden the scope of telemedicine. We've, we've shown that it can be done successfully in the acute care direct-to-consumer model. We're trying to launch this to other areas. So I mentioned rheumatology and psychiatry, but other fields that are, to me, no-brainers, dermatology, because you know, most derms, they can identify the lesion to a simple picture. Uh, primary care. Uh, as I mentioned, Nevada ranks in the bottom five states in terms of primary care per capita. So we're hoping to leverage that into increased access for our, for our patients. Uh, we're also trying to steer more patients away so far, we've taken kind of a passive approach um, to getting patients converted from urgent care to telemedicine. Uh, we'll post wait times, we'll offer them telemedicine, but it's kind of passive. And the thing is, most of these, most of these patients are somewhat reluctant to enroll and to go on to now clinic. Um, so we've identified about a dozen conditions, simple bladder infections, medication refills, referrals, work notes, that when patients come in and we screen them, we'll say, you know, it's about an hour to see a provider here. If you have no objections, we can get you seen directly right now with a telemedicine provider. And we'll have to guide them through the enrollment process and actually see them through now now clinic. But we hope to really drive increased utilization that way. Okay. So that concludes my presentation. And I think we have some time now for some questions and answers. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sunfone. We had a, a lot of questions come in. If anyone else has any more questions, please feel free to type them in and we'll get to them on the call. Um, so the first question is, can you explain the biggest takeaways from that SMA Now Clinic pilot program? Yeah, so the pilot program was launched in October. and This was just to our uh, United Health members here in the state of Nevada. Um, and I tell you, it was so new and at the time no one had conducted any telemedicine visits. So we, we just welcomed as many comments as we could. You know, uh, we're not trained in residency to do these visits, uh, although, you know, current progress might be. So there are a lot of nervous habits that people don't realize they have. And so it was very useful to have patients comment, hey, look, you know, you're, you're swiveling too much, you're playing with your hair, you're not looking at the webcam. So those were the kind of things that we were trying to focus on. You know, how do we present ourselves better in front of the webcam uh, and to work through some of those tech glitches. Great. Um, another question is about um, just physician recruitment. Can you tell me more about recruiting physicians and what your initial process was? Yeah, I, I can tell you when we first introduced this to our urgent care providers, saying, look, you know, you might have to see some of these visits. I can tell you a third are highly engaged, highly motivated, very curious. You have a third that are sort of indifferent. You know, I'll do it just because I have to. And you have a third that are highly resistant. Now, those things, you know, the last group, it's hard to recruit. Um, but what I can tell you is that after year one, 
when we showed it could be done successfully with high provider satisfaction, we now have a wait list to get into telemedicine. So I tell these providers, you know what, two years ago you should have signed on when I asked you. So now they have to wait. So I can tell you that the providers are highly satisfied with telemedicine. Great. Um, and we also had a question about the upper respiratory um, study. Uh, basically just saying, can you explain the results of the study that 26% of urgent care utilizers came back and only 4% of now clinic users sought additional care? And explain that and what you think that can be attributed to. Yeah. I think there's some selection bias because, you know, I think patients for the most part use good judgment. You know, we, we rarely have patients come on telemedicine who shouldn't be there. And so I, I would say perhaps the, the rest of infection is probably more severe in urgent care uh, versus one who actually went to telemedicine. They probably just had a common cold, uh, not very severe symptoms. So again, there is some selection bias, but the point is that very few of these guys came back for a second visit. Great. Um, the next question is, how are you able to proxy into the visit for observation? Do you have to get patient consent beforehand? Yes, yeah, we have to have, because one requirement is that, you know, when you supervise APAs that you have to have direct observation, you know, most of our providers don't even reside here. So the question is, how do we get a, a physician who is based in Las Vegas to actually visualize and observe? Well, that's the only way. So you can actually proxy onto the desktop, but yes, you have to let the patient know, hey, look, do you mind if my you know, physician preceptor observes this? Great. Um, the next question is, given such a short timeline for implementation, um, what are some highlights from your vendor selection process? Yeah, like, like I said, uh, it turned out that we already had an existing relationship between Optum and American Well. So a lot of things we didn't have to recreate. Um, and that was highly, highly useful for us because had we had to create this de novo, it would have taken much, much more time because we were given basically three months between announcement and then the pilot. And so again, so we have to leverage our, our colleagues in Minnesota who had done this already. Um, so it really wasn't a big deal because they had a long-standing relationship already with American Well. Hey, um, the next question is, did you receive any pushback or negativity regarding this, initi this initiative from your immediate care clinics or PCP relationships? If so, how did you kind of um, navigate that? You know, I think for most of the urgent providers, this is you know, it was sort of a, a curiosity. You know, they want to see where this would go. But but as far as negativity, no, because you know the problem here in, in Nevada is that we just don't have enough providers. You know, our urgent cares are overstressed, and anything we can do to alleviate some of that that stress on the urgent cares is welcome. And so even now with this new program to to actively recruit patients from urgent care to telemedicine. It's, it's a welcome thing because these guys are really overworked in the urgent care setting. Great. Um, and the next question could be for either you, Dr. Samson, or, or Dr. Antel as well. It's just asking about kind of what you see for the future of telemedicine in terms of use cases. Peter, you want to take that? Yeah, Gene, I'll let you go first on that one. Okay. Yeah, so, so for us, you know, I mean, telemedicine is going by leap, leaps and bounds. You know, and, and if you know, as a medical group nowadays, if you don't have telemedicine in the works, you're going to be left far behind. So we were an early adopter, and in the world of telemedicine, three years is a long time. Um, again, we've shown that it can be done in our space, which is directing consumer episodic care. We want to take it to the next step now. You mentioned Kaiser, right? So, you know, we are considered the Kaiser in Nevada, so we want to make sure that, that all of our specialties can utilize telemedicine to the best of their capabilities. We just, at this point, don't have enough primary care providers. In our group right now, we are down about 20 PCPs, okay? It's going to take us several years to recruit that many. And so one of the things that we can do is we can easily hire, you know, providers to do telemedicine uh, from other states. You know, for us, that would solve really the labor shortage and the access issue. So we see this as a huge potential to, to really, really uh, address our access needs here in Nevada. And I, and I would just add that I, I think organ, uh, provider organizations around the country are, are finding that, that if, you, if they look around their, their enterprise, there, there is almost no specialty uh, for whom uh, telehealth could, could not uh, play a role or, or have some utility. Um, and I, I really bucket it out into the three main buckets of, of sort of categories of use cases. First of all, there's, there's the one-offs, and, and that's a lot of the telemedicine that already exists today. There's the you know on-demand acute care visits. There's 
behavioral health screening visits, uh, et cetera. The second bucket is, is around uh, replacing some of the ongoing care, the follow-up care that, that exists today in brick and mortar but doesn't need to or require brick and mortar. So that would be the med management, the follow-up visits, the, the ongoing care for the diabetic. Um, the final uh, bucket is, is, is really looking at how do we build new programs? How do, we, how do we reconfigure our triage process to make use of telehealth? How do we build uh, programs around a, a disease state, a population health-oriented program? How do we build coordinated or team-based care around a disease state like diabetes or around uh, behavioral health concerns? How do we import allied health providers or specialists right into the primary care office to coordinate care? And so really almost any specialty um, can make use of this. At its heart, telehealth is really uh, uh, just another modality or another point of care. Um, and, and for each provider type, for each organization, um, it's, really, it's really up to them to, to, to decide how, how this might work for them and their patients. Great. Thank you both. Um, the next question is, when, when you offer telehealth to patients who come, for the, come into the clinic, do you have a kiosk or some sort of other location the patient can immediately use the telehealth option, or, or do they have to go home to use it? They have both. We, we, we actually have uh, rooms that are set up with the monitor webcam where they can conduct the visit in private. Um, but I said, uh, like I said, many days, many times nowadays, people prefer to use their smartphones. Uh, the only problem with that sometimes is just the uh, privacy issue. Um, but still, we have quite a few people who actually connect with us on the waiting rooms through their smartphones. So they have the option of both. Great. Um, and in, in line with the uh, in-clinic marketing and advertising, was there any concern from physicians that in-clinic advertising would be taking away their patients? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, our urgent cares are brimming right now. Um, you know, in the winter time, we routinely have wait times of, you know, close to two hours. Um, and that leads to increased stress and lower patient satisfaction and really provide a burnout. So, so our providers, you know, they have, they have no problems whatsoever. We can divert some of these people away and try to even out that workload because telemedicine, we have lots of capacity, you know. Um, so they have no problems whatsoever in trying to lev you know, level load the work uh, among different areas. Great. And how will you maintain the same commitment to quality when you expand um, telehealth to include specialty services? I think it's going to be the same scrutiny that we have. You know, when we first started, like I mentioned, the first six months, we reviewed 100% of cases. The same thing is with the specialties, too. Now, the good thing is the volumes are very low right now with rheumatology, psychiatry, so it's not hard to monitor those kind of things. For the specialists, it's really a matter of just starting to do it. You know, I think there's a lot of trepidation about telehealth, but once you start doing it, you find it's incredibly easy. Consumers really appreciate it, so very high patient satisfaction. So the ones who've tried it, I really liked it quite a bit. Um, in fact, one of the rheumatologists was mentioning that his colleagues are now asking, you know, how can I do some of that too? Because they see that the patients really enjoy the service and it's, you know, it's a, it's a fun thing to do for the providers too. Great. Um, and we talked a lot about kind of alleviating physician concerns, but what about the patients? Was there any concerns from patients or um, did you find they needed to be educated on exactly what telehealth was? The, the, the challenge is getting them to to try it, okay. But I, I mean, and when I when I do the visits, I always ask patients, so how did you hear about this? They'll say, well, I heard it through a friend or through my workplace. But I can tell you that at the end of every visit, generally speaking, they're so satisfied. Just the fact that they don't have to to get dressed, get out of the house, bring the kids along, wait in urgent care, the copay is lower. So almost always, the experience I get uh, from them is is highly favorable. So once you try it um, and you have a successful connection, you're, you're likely to come back. Great. Um, and another question on how did you arrive at the 3% um, telehealth utilization rate to predict future demand? Yeah, that, that was a complete guess. Yeah, we had no idea. So we just thought, well, 3% seems pretty reasonable. It seems like a good number. But again, we really had, had no idea. And then, as it turned out, it was more like 1.5% that first year because we ended up at 5,000. Um, but that was just a number we had to choose. You know, at the time, there was really no other model doing it. So there's nothing for us to, to kind of uh, lean on or, you know, for guidance. So something we just came up with, you know. 
Great. Um, and the last question is, what's your advice for getting started um, with a telehealth program for health system? Well, I think it's important to have a good partner because, you know, it is so new. The last thing you want to do is, is do something and you've got tech glitches or, you know, service commitments you can't honor. Um, so that's number one. Number two is you have to have providers who are highly engaged and motivated. You can't force it upon patients or providers, right? Um, and you have to have an open mind, you know. You know, at Southwest, you know, we've always thought we were pretty innovative. You know, we were the first area to do EMR, do radiology, e prescribing. And so we just kind of thought this was a natural evolution. Um, you know, you have to have a good, good vision. You know, I can say that things like online commerce, you know, you never thought 15 years ago that people would be buying cars online, meeting their spouses online. So I think over time, I think providers uh, and patients, you know, in the future, when you have an urgent care need, you won't think about going to urgent care. You're going to think about picking up your smartphone connecting virtually. So you have to have that sort of vision. Great. And Peter, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, I, I agree with everything uh, Gene said. Uh, just, you know, you want to find a partner who can, who's, who's done this, who can help you uh, kind of walk through the steps. Um, there are important key steps as you embark on building a program, you know, whether it's getting executive uh, leadership and, and budget, whether it's, uh, you know, deciding on uh, how, how to align your program with your organization's strategic goals, or how do you build use cases? And there really are some some key elements, but but many organizations have conquered these, and there are many best practices out there. So uh, you know, just getting coordinated with organizations uh, that can help you uh, walk through these steps. Great. Well, I know we got a ton of questions that came in. Um, I tried to get to as many as we can. Some of them just require a little bit of individual follow up. So we will follow up with everyone who asked questions who we didn't get to. Um, but with that, I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Sanfong for a great presentation. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, we, uh, we also did a case study uh, with Southwest Medical, and I could send that out to everyone with the webinar recording as well. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sanfong. Thank you, Dr. Antal. It was a great presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I appreciate it. Have a great day.